everyone, please welcome to the stage Maria Safidari, Wikimedia Foundation Board Chair. Good morning. Welcome to the 15th annual Wikimania. I should also say welcome to Sweden. Woo! This is the first time that Wikimania has been hosted in the Nordics. We have more than 800 Wikimedians in Stockholm from over 80 countries here to celebrate free knowledge and what we have achieved together. The theme of this year's conference is Stronger Together, Wikimedia, Free Knowledge, and the Sustainable Development Goals. It's appropriate that we are in Sweden, known for its focus on sustainability and gender equality. This weekend is an opportunity to talk about the UN SDGs and the role that we, as Wikimedians, can play in addressing some of these urgent issues. The SDGs are issues that are highly relevant to all of our lives, from education to gender diversity, to environmental sustainability, to name, but, to name just but a few. This weekend is a chance to dive deeper into the SDGs and think about how they overlap with your work and free knowledge. It is a critical time to be thinking about the broader impact of our work. This event, this event marks the next stage in our movement strategy process, an incredibly diverse collaborative process that we've, have the, have, we've undertaken over the past two years to figure out the future of our movement. Wikimedians new and old across borders and hundreds of languages have participated in this unprecedented process to think about what we want, where we want to be in 2030. This weekend, you'll hear more and be able to share your thoughts and ideas on the recommendations as we move forward to implementation and change. I want to take a moment to thank Wikimedia Sweden for all of their work organizing the event and this weekend for all of us. This year's agenda includes the most community-led programs of any Wikimania we have ever held. This weekend includes sessions that you have told us you want to hear, with the spaces and topics created and led by community leaders. This is your conference. That means that whether this is your first Wikimania or your tenth Wikimania, there will be something for you in our three days of sessions. I also want to thank all of the partners and sponsors that have made this event possible. And to talk a little bit more about Wikimedia Sweden and of all the work behind the scenes, it is my pleasure to introduce John Anderson, the Executive Director of Wikimedia Sweden. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Stockholm. Thirteen years ago, I got involved in the Wikimedia movement as an editor on the Swedish language version of Wikipedia. At that time, I was a student at Umeå University, and I wanted to make a difference. I thought Wikipedia looked pretty cool, and figured perhaps I could add parts of the university assignments that I was writing onto the articles on Wikipedia. So I started doing that. At that time, I was studying Peace and Conflict Studies and I quickly realized there was a lot of information missing about different cultures and different countries in the world. So I continued editing. After a while, I became an administrator on Wikipedia, and I spent countless hours on improving it, trying to contribute in my little way. From this grew something that has become a meaningful and major part of my life. What I came to realize after writing on Wikipedia for a while was that Wikipedia was really just the top of the iceberg. Behind this online encyclopedia was an entire movement, a community of volunteers and staff that are extremely dedicated on bringing free knowledge to the world. What I came to learn about was the Wikimedia movement. This movement of free knowledge lovers, they work on, of course, writing Wikipedia articles, but they also take photos and videos of the world to illustrate it. Since 2012, they've been working on structuring data onto Wikidata, 
as a way to make it machine accessible, something that is crucial for artificial, artificial intelligence. They digitized books, historical books, to preserve endangered languages. They organized trainings and events. They find partners and help them share their content. They are the ones that build the software that makes Wikipedia run for the 500 million people that come there to read and learn every month. There are thousands of people working on thousands of different projects, large and small. Yet this is one global movement. No one decides what volunteers should do. No one controls them. They do what they feel are interesting and what they care about. Yet this is still working. This is crowdsourcing, and it's simply amazing that it works. So writing articles is what got me started all these years ago, but I did not expect that I would have ended up here. Because today, I'm very, very happy and excited to welcome all of you to this year's Wikimania conference here in Stockholm. For us at Wikimedia Sweden, we are more than thrilled to host this conference. Not just because standing on a stage in front of a thousand people is pretty cool, scary and humbling, but it also kind of makes you feel a little bit like a rock star. <laughs> but, you know, hosting a conference such as this has allowed us to introduce our work to so many great new volunteers and partners. It has also allowed us to tell Sweden about all the great things the Wikimedia movement is doing. And we will continue to tell people in Sweden about what's, I mean, how, what we're working on, uh, utilizing material from this very conference. Here in Sweden, we have a few initiatives that have a global focus that you will find here in the conference program. We are supporting organizations to share their content online, uh, for example, historical collections from museums. And to do, to do this more efficiently, we are working now to develop a technical team here in Sweden that will help support and build tools for the global movement. We are developing a text-to-speech solution called Wikispeech, which is a way for people to listen to Wikipedia. So if you cannot read, for, for any reason, you can still access all the great material we have. <laughs> Thank you for that. We're working with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs to organize edathons at Swedish embassies across the world, together with local Wikimedia affiliates and volunteers and local partners. This is a, a campaign intended to reduce the gender gap, and we call it Wikigap. The Ministry is also the one that supplied us with all these great things here on the stage. We are working with UNESCO, with Wikimedia Foundation and the Swedish Postcode Lottery to collect information about all the world's galleries, libraries, archives and museums, what is often referred to as GLAMs. To case studies, we're also identifying what technical solution we need to develop to be able to efficiently uh, add their content onto our platforms. And this is a project we call Finding GLAMs. And of course, we hope to host a number of more conferences here in Sweden to bring together our great movement in the years to come and plan for future projects and initiatives. But today, uh, I'm very happy to, to talk about the conference uh, in Stockholm. This very conference, we came in 2019. As you've heard, it's been organized 15 times, but this is the first time in Northern Europe. And ever since we sent in our application to host Wikimania, I've been worried about three different things. What, is, what the weather would be here in Sweden, what, the, what you would think about the Swedish food, and what you would think about all the major things we changed in the conference this year. As you might remember, I warned you about these things when I was on stage in Cape Town in South Africa last year. But I'm very happy to see that you were not scared off. In fact, we had a record number of 800 applicants for the scholarships, around 400 submissions for the program, and today we have around 900 people attending. It was also great that we had 150 people applying to become volunteers. And with so... <laughs> With so many great uh, volunteer applicants, it was really tough to handpick the 50 volunteers that are now working with us to support all aspects of the conference. We also had a wonderful um, program committee led by Lee and Wyatt that did a fantastic job of organizing all the programs. We had a... We had a wonderful scholarship committee that had to go through all the 800 applicants, which is a very tough job. And we also have 50 people that has helped online to help translate the material we have and to help spread it to their communities. An extremely important job. So I would like to give another round of applause for all of these great people. So please join me in that one.
Thank you so much for your work. It is truly amazing. And without you, it would not have been possible to organize this conference. This year, we have a theme for the conference. You see it here up on the screen. Stronger Together, Wikimedia, Free Knowledge, and the Sustainable Development Goals. We wanted a theme that was presenting our work in a new light, that was forward-looking, and that was inclusive. The Sustainable Development Goals, they were, at least in my opinion, the perfect lens to look through to, work, to achieve this. And soon, Michael Peter Edson, will from the UN Museum Live, he will introduce you to these goals in depth. And our hope as organizers is that the theme will be a source of inspiration for you guys to think about all the great things you're already doing and see how this is actually helping to contribute to these sustainable goals. Oh, sorry. But before Michael enters the stage to talk about the goals, I would like to share how the theme has influenced all aspects of the conference planning. We work very hard to ensure that this conference is as environmentally friendly as we can. This entire event is carbon neutral, uh, thanks to our work with our organization TerraPass. And this includes all of your trips here. We have reduced paper and plastic waste, we have carefully chosen catering, and we have tried to inform all of you how you can travel here with the least environmental impact. Ensuring that this conference represents a diverse and beautiful community has been another central piece. This is reflected in a diverse program with speakers from across the world, of different backgrounds, genders, and more. It is also shown through the work done to capture and live stream as much as possible to allow for people to take part across the world, even if they could not travel here. Partners are, of course, crucial for the success of a conference such as this, and our great partners made this possible. I would like to thank all of the Wikimedia organizations across the world that has helped us and supported the, these efforts. And I would especially like to thank the Wikimedia Foundation, Wikimedia Deutschland, Wikimedia Norway, and Wikimedia Finland. Without this, Without you guys, this would not have been the same. The conference team at Wikimedia Foundation has worked long days to make this all happen, and I would like to thank Joel, Isabel, Luis, Aaron Blank, and Sam, and all of that for their great efforts. I would also like to thank all of our sponsors, our partners, and our supporters. You're all great, and I very much look forward to working even closer with you in the future. And I would especially like to mention the support from the Swedish Postcard Lottery, whose support has been crucial to get this conference where we wanted it. On this slide, you see our great sponsors and the many supporting organizations of this conference. And I would especially like to draw your attention to Draw It Big, that's here on stage with me, Frida and Osa, who's helping to record this whole conference. It is really wonderful to have been able to work with all these great partners um, in this work. There's been a lot of interest for this conference, not the least because Wikipedia is so extremely used here in Sweden. 86% of all the people that are online in Sweden, they use Wikipedia regularly. For people... <laughs> oh, it gets better. For, for people under 40, 90% use Wikipedia regularly. Just think about that for a second. What other source of information has ever been able to reach so many people? Now, please look around you. A large part of the people that help make this Wikipedia work and create this great resource are in this room. Well, in reality, it's around 0.4% of all the 250,000 volunteers we have, but they are some of the key players. And you all can, and hopefully will, help make Wikipedia even better and worthy of the trust that people put on it. But of course, we're not doing this ourselves. And to bring other organizations that are working with free knowledge to this conference has been something I'm very excited about. This afternoon, we will have Creative Commons, we will have the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, Internet Archive, and many more tell how they are uh, contributing to free knowledge and how it helps sustain the sustainable development goals. And I hope you will take this opportunity to network with them and learn from, their, from your peers during this entire conference. Together, and only together, we can truly change the world. And with that, I would like to hand over to Erik Lut our conference manager, and one of the people that made this whole event possible. Thank you, Eric, and thank you to you all. Thank you. Wow, that's a big crowd. I'm very excited to be able to be here today because we have worked very hard from the Wikimedia Sveria chapter for the last almost year to make this possible. My speech today is going to be one of the most exciting ones for this year's Wikimania. It's the one that's going to cover housekeeping and logistics. And I hope it's going to get very good uh, grades from you in the evaluation afterwards. 
if something happens, if there is an emergency and we all have to leave this room as quickly as possible, look for this sign. That's the sign for the emergency exits. You find emergency exits all across th this uh, lecture hall. Uh, and uh, the good thing to think about is to try to get out as quickly as possible and gather at the lawn outside of Aula Magna. Grab only what you have in your hands and try to get out of here as quickly as possible. Hopefully nothing would ha will happen, but it's very important to know if there should be something. There is a trust and safety team uh, present here at Wikimania 2019. We're very exciting, excited to be able to, to present a safe environment for all of you who are here. You can recognize the people in the trust and safety team by the red bandanas they are wearing when they are on duty. On this picture, you'll find Crystal, Joe, and Calliope, who are among the trust and safety team. They will also be sitting in the community village and the interactive tables in Södra Huset, which is one of the parts of this year's venue. If you need someone in the trusted team, and if you need to talk to any one of them, look for the red bandana, go to, the, uh, go to their table in the community village, or you can also help ask the help desk to get in contact with them. This year we have provided CPR training to almost all of the volunteers that are here today. This is a way for us to make sure that if there is something that happens, you'll all be safe. But remember, however, if anything happens, call 112. 112 is the number to the Swedish emergency uh, services. I know that we have different numbers across the world. The one to remember for this year's Wikimania is 112. Hopefully, no one will have to use it. But if you have to, to get in contact with the emergency services, this is the number that you're supposed to call. And call them before you do anything else. If you have called them, notify any of the managers here on site if you, have, if you need any kind of help. Uh, there is also on the back side of your badge a number to the campus security. They are happy to help if you have any kinds of needs that relates to security. You will also notice when you go across the Aula Magna building that there are security guards inside here. They are also happy to help if you should have any need. One of the things that I'm, makes me very excited about the Wikimedia movement is the extreme diversity. We can see this diversity here in this room today. We come from different cultures, different countries, different backgrounds, from different religions. We are very diverse. That's a very fantastic thing. But that also means that we sometimes have to think about how we treat each other and how we talk with each other. In order to, in order to be able to ensure that, we have a friendly space policy. And everyone who is registered for this event has signed and agreed to this year's friendly space policy. You can read the entire policy on the Wikimania Wiki, and it's also printed uh, and, uh, at several places across the venue. The important thing when we deal with each other is the common belief. Anyone who is in this room believes dearly in free knowledge, and, and that free knowledge can liberate people. If we, if we remember that and try to uh, treat every one of us with, uh, with respect, I think this conference is going to go very, very well. If there is an incident, if someone treats you badly, harasses you, or if there is any kind of incident, feel free again to reach out to the trust and safety team. You may also have noticed that there is a new photo policy for Wikimania 2019. You can read that online. You can also read it on the text here uh, on, the, on the back of the screen. I will read it just to make sure that everyone understands it. It says, I understand that I am not allowed to take or publish photographs or videos of people at this conference without getting consent, consent of everyone depicted. Standing up for a group photo is considered consent, as is publicly presenting on stage. If I do not want my image captured on photo or video at all, I can ask for a special lanyard at registration. That means that people who are wearing a red lanyard, they don't want to be photographed at all. Please respect that when you are documenting. We are a crowd that loves documentation. I love that too myself. But it's very important that we also respect that everyone does not want to be on a photo. I think it's very common sense, really. Uh, make sure that people want to be on the photo that you take of them, and make sure that they agree to you uploading it before you do it. One of the other things that makes, makes me very excited about this year's conference is that we are, have been working hard together with Utbildningsradion, which is one of the Swedish public broadcasters, to document this entire session in Aula Magna today. I think that's very fantastic that the public broadcaster is willing to do this, and I'm very excited to see the result, which will eventually be aired at Swedish television later on during the fall. That means that uh, summaries of what is happening, again, inside here will be uh, aired on Swedish television. If you don't want to be aired on Swedish television, uh, make sure to go or retreat towards the back of this uh, lecture hall. If you want to be very, very sure that you are not on any kind of documented uh, places at all, you can use any of the balconies, uh, which will be totally safe. 
It's also very exciting, I think, that we will be able to receive a CC BY copy of the, of the documentation from Utbildningsradion. That means that we will, in the end, be able to also spread everything that's happening inside here today on Wikimedia Commons. Yeah, I really think that's worth, worthy of an applause. Um, our goal from Wikimedia Sweden side is to document every session at this conference that does not explicitly require otherwise. We have a team of volunteers and we also have a team from the Wikimedia Foundation's team that will help out with trying to make sure that everything is documented. You can see in the program which, which sessions that have explicitly said that they don't want to be, uh, that they don't want to be documented. Um, but speaking loudly in an event which is documented is seen as consent to document your voice. All in all, if we manage to document everything that is happening, that means that we will end up with between two and 300 hours of documentation from this year's Wikimania. And I think that's going to be pretty amazing to, use, to be able to use that afterwards. A few words about the program, and maybe especially what's happening in this room today. Uh, after lunch, as you may know, we're going to have something that we have called the Free Knowledge and the Global Goals Spotlight Session. We have, we have invited a couple of really good speakers and partners and friends to the movement who will give their views on how free knowledge can, uh, can contribute to, towards the global goals. On the screen, you see only a few of them, uh, but there's going to be, uh, I think it's eight or nine different speakers giving their views this afternoon. And my hope is that after all those uh, spotlights, we will have a really good view as a starting ground to, f to fur further our work on how free knowledge can can contribute to the global goals. When it comes to the program in itself, it ended up with more than 250 items across 19 different spaces. And as far as I understand, that's the largest program that has ever been held at the Wikimania. It includes workshops, lectures, roundtables, seminars, and it's very diverse in its setup. All the sessions that will be inside here, except for the one today, will be documented by the Wikimedia Foundation. And most rooms will, again, be documented or recorded by volunteers from Wikimedia Sweden. If this is your first ever Wikimania, we have tried to make it clear in the program which sessions are, are especially suited if it is uh, a first-time Wikimania attendee. Look for ideal for newbies icons, and you can go to, uh, to sessions that will be very easy to understand for anyone. It may be a bit tricky this first day to find your way across the venue. We have plenty of volunteers that will try to help you. We have maps across the venue, but it is a bit, I think it's very beautiful. It's, it's a wonderful place to be on, but it's a bit quirky and sometimes there are a lot of corridors and everything goes in different directions. We will do our best to make sure that everyone can find their way, uh, in, if not already, by the end of, the, of this day. I made sure to add a map to this presentation. This is the general layout of how Wikimania 2019's venue will look like. We are at this point in Aula Magna, which is, maybe you can read that on the, on the screen. Uh, if not, it's, um, it's not the largest one. The largest one to the, to the top left, that's Södra Huset, which will include a lot of the breakout sessions. To the right of the Södra Huset, there is the Al Huset and Aula Magna, and those two buildings are connected. So you can go th from here to Al Huset without leaving this building. Aula Magna will be used for a lot of sessions as well, as will also Juristenas Hus, which is uh, in that direction. Juristenas Hus has proven to be very hard to pronounce for a lot of people inside here. You can always go to a Swede if you need help with pronunciation. Hopefully everyone, by the end of this uh, weekend at least, will be able to say Juristenas Hus without any flaw. <laughs> We're also very excited to be able to introduce you or to welcome you to, a to two social events. Those social events are possible due to our close work with several of our partners. Um, one event will take place in the Stockholm City Hall. You're all invited to attend the welcome reception which is hosted in the City Hall uh, by the Stockholm City Council. The, the um, City Hall was built in the early 20th century and I think it's one of the landmarks of, of Stockholm. Um, the other social event, event will be the closing party which is going to be hosted at the Nordic Museum in the large hall. Uh, some of you who uh, have been here for a while may have already been to the Nordic Museum, but it's a beautiful building that is located uh, in Stockholm as well. So with those two uh, social events, I hope that we will have, a, except for the program and everything that's taking place here, a very a, a large amount of time to also be able to socialize and have a really good time together. 
some fun and exciting logistical information about how to get to the opening reception today. Uh, this is kind of the one really, really important time of this year's Wikimania. In order to ensure that everyone will be at time at the City Hall, we have buses going from here to the City Hall after the sessions end here today. The buses will leave between 5.30 and 6. We will have volunteers who will guide you in the right directions to be able to find the places where the buses will pick you up. There will be two main um, picking up locations for the buses. One uh, will be... Um, uh, just outside Aula Magna, and one will be just outside Södra Huset uh, and Al Huset. In order to get to the bus, uh, buses outside Aula Magna, just go out from here and to the furthest left, or to your right, uh, in that direction. Um, go down the stairs and exit in that direction, then you will be able to find uh, one of the bus picking up areas. The other one will be um, between Södra Huset and Al Huset, and Söder Huset, you remember, was the, oh, the large building at the top left. So if you go between Al Huset and Söder Huset, you'll be able to get to, um, to the other bus location. But don't worry, again, there will be several volunteers. They are, have white t-shirts and they are very happy to help you find the way to the buses. And that's a photo of one of the uh, locations. Um, out of respect for the, for the Stockholm City Hall, please arrive at City Hall before the doors open at 6.25. If you go by the buses, there's no way that you won't be able to do this. If you're going there by yourself, it's really important that you respect this time. If those of you taking the buses, you'll, getting, uh, you'll be getting an entrance ticket when you, go, when you go up on the bus. This must be presented when you enter the City Hall. If you want to go to the City Hall by yourself, Volunteers will stand outside of the city hall and give you those tickets, but they have to be uh, presented in order to be able to uh, to get into the city hall. You must also uh, wear a Wikimania badge in order to enter the reception, and unfortunately, guests are not permitted. For the Nordic Museum closing reception, that party on Sunday it will start at eight and close at midnight. In uh, w when you registered, you got uh, an entrance ticket. This one must be presented in order to enter a Nordic Museum. In, in, your, uh, in your badge as well, you'll uh, hopefully have two drink tickets. Those can be exchanged when you get into the Nordic Museum uh, to get drinks at the museum. At the museum, we're also very excited to be able to uh, host the museum scavenger hunt. And you can see the sign at the entrance for more details about this exciting thing. Um, again. When you enter the Nordic Museum, you must also wear a Wikimania badge, and guests are unfortunately not permitted. And finally, we have a third, uh, a bit smaller, but still very important social event. Everyone who uh, went to the Wikimedia conference in, in, uh, in Berlin earlier this year will al already know about it. Uh, but this weekend, except for being Wikimania 2019, also starts the surströmming uh, time of Sweden each year. If you don't know what surströmming is, it's very tasteful fermented herring. Uh, the university says it's okay for us to, to get you to taste it as long as we're outside. Make sure to collect all the trash and throw it away far away from here in order to make sure that there's nothing stinking here afterwards. The series drumming tasting, it will take place tomorrow uh, at five. It's gonna be just outside Aula Magna in that direction. And we are very happy to see all the funny faces that attendees will do when you try to taste the fermented herring. With those words, I think that I have said all the very funny, exciting, and logistical things of this year's Wikimania. If you have any questions, there are always people in the, in the help desk that can answer uh, your questions. Uh, and we will, together from the, from the conference team, try to make sure that you have uh, everything that you need in order to have a really good conference. And with those words, I'd really like to invite uh, our keynote speaker of this year's Wikimania, uh, long time. Uh, Wikipedia fan and uh, devotee of open content, and also uh, co-founder of the M Museum of the United Nations UN Live. A warm round of applause for Michael Peter Edson. Thank you. That was awesome. I love that. <sighs> Good morning, everybody.
Okay, I think we're good. Hi. <laughs> hey. This is my spirit animal, this moose, this Balahars moose. I really uh, appreciate that. Whoever designed that made me feel very much at home and put me in the right mood to come and speak with you this morning. Um, how do we get difficult work done in society? Uh, and by we, I mean you as a community, I mean you as individuals, I mean you as, as citizens of your countries, as human beings, as life forms, and I mean us, we in this room, because there's a lot to do. And related to that question really is another question. How do we get millions or realistically billions of people working together on global goals. And I put global goals as, as broadly and openly as possible, things that need to get done. I'm Michael Edson. I'm co-founder and associate director of this thing called the Museum for the United Nations, UN Live. And before I left my secure, happy, wonderful job at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington to start this job, I was a digital strategist, a web maker and doer, a huge believer in the vision of the web, of the internet, as a place where we could do important work together as society and have a lot of fun. Um, I've been working in museums for 25 years, but I don't think of myself as a museum person. I'm a painter and a printmaker by training. Like many people my age, we were doing other things when the internet got interesting. I think the first web page I saw was for the Museum of Paleontology at Stanford University on Mosaic XXX version XXX. Um, my first job at the Smithsonian was cleaning plexiglass. Uh, wax on, wax off, $10 a case. Uh, and it was in a lot of ways the best job I ever had. Um, I'm gonna start today, we're gonna talk, talk, talk. We're gonna play, play, play. We're gonna work together a little bit. We're gonna talk a little more and then I'm going to leave you with a big open-ended question, which is how can this community which has accomplished so much together stretch a little bit to accomplish something more. So a few stories, a few thought starters here. Doink. Um, this is a, a, a pottery studio, and I'm thinking of an anecdote from the book Art and Fear, Observations on the Perils and Rewards of Art Making. And, and in this story, can I break the plane here? Yes, I can. Um, Stay in the light. Uh, so in this pottery class, as the story's told, the first day of class in a college pottery class, and the professor says, okay, everyone, I'm going to divide this class in half. Everyone on this side of the room, I'm going to grade you on the last day of class, depending on the weight of the pots that you make during the semester. If you make, a, I'm going to bring in my bathroom scale and we're going to put your pots on it. If you make 100 pounds of pots, you get an A. If you make 80 pounds of pots, you get a B and so on and so on. You over here, bring me one pot on the last day of class and I will grade you on that pot. Now, go learn and make. And as the story is told, it was apparent from the very first days of class that by far the best work was happening not from the group assigned to quality, but the group assigned to quantity. It seemed that when students were trying to do work that mattered, those assigned to think about quality were standing around contemplating perfection, while those assigned to quantity were just trying things out and learning. It was clear to everyone in the class. So that's story number one. Story number two is a kind of intro is, 
I was privileged to be a juror for the MacArthur Foundation's 100 and Change initiative. The MacArthur Foundation had a, a change in strategy where they thought instead of spreading around, around a lot of money to a lot of worthy projects, we're going to fund one major project to solve a major problem and put a hundred million dollars on the table for that over three years. And I read a lot of these proposals and they were all breathtaking. Um, not only new kinds of problems that I had imagined, but ways of working on problems that I had not imagined before. But what was very apparent as a juror was that a hundred million dollars doesn't buy you much. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Um, in one project, as I recall, uh, it was proposing to reform the child welfare system in the United States. The child welfare system in the United States spends $23 billion a year. So over three years, the MacArthur Foundation's $100 million could accomplish, what is that, 1 60th, 1 600th of that scale. A hundred million dollars didn't do that much when you start looking at big work that needs to happen. So there must be another way. Three out of four intro stories. In the 1990s, the Urban Institute went to Oakland, California to study cultural participation among underprivileged communities. So they sent field workers out to the streets and they said, so where do you get your culture? And they were met with blank stares. <laughs> People said, we don't have that stuff around here. Sorry. But to their credit, the researchers went back to the lab and they asked the question a different way. When they came back a few months later, they said, who are the creative people in your community? And when they asked the question that way, they received an outpouring of, of ideas and thoughts and excitement about the poets, the rappers, the artists, the musicians, the singers, the writers, the doers in their neighborhoods. The problem wasn't that there weren't creative people in the community. The problem was that people hadn't learned to associate their creative cultural daily lives, the grammar of their daily lives, with the institutions that were founded and funded over many years to serve them. Last intro story, getting warmed up. The snowpocalypse in Washington, D.C. in 2010, February 2010. I forget, it was three feet of snow. It's not much for Stockholm, Sweden, um, but it was a lot for us. <laughs> And it came on very quickly, and um, some friends of mine were organizing a big technology conference for that weekend. And many people had already arrived for the, and I mean a big conference, 2010. This was a little bit after the dot-com bubble burst, but still a lot of money coming to Washington, D.C. to meet and sell. Um, so people were stuck in hotel rooms. The conference organizers canceled the conference. I, was drawn to you, John, and everyone, God forbid something like that happens here, but they canceled the conference. The insurance policy for the conference kicked in, said, all of you organizers, you have to put down your laptops and pens, you can't do anything, it's over. But the attendees didn't get that memo. So sitting around in their hotel rooms, they created their own conference. <laughs> they created the UnTech 10 conference on the fly, using free tools, wikis, YouTube, Facebook. They uh, somehow managed, I forget what the live streaming uh, app was at the time, maybe not even an app, uh, but they made their own conference and most participants said it was better than the official one, <laughs> right? House party beats uh, you know, a formal dinner any day of the week. Um, and the organizers were both enthralled because this was their community that was rising up and showing what they were made of and also terrified because the conference group spent a year and hundreds of thousands of dollars and a big team organizing this thing that the people did on their own better, faster, and cheaper. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> um, so, what do we take away from this? 
there are many alternatives to top-down problem solving, closer to the ground, bottom-up, distributed, networked, and local. And these are words that I've heard over the years as I've talked to people about what they do and how they work that I respond to a lot. Networked, close to the ground, bottom-up, distributed. Two, money's great. <laughs> I've seen a lot of projects fail for want of money, but even large amounts of money under central control are not enough to solve certain kinds of problems. And I am aware that I'm standing on a stage with an articulation of some of the greatest challenges we have as human beings now. There's a tremendous potential and vitality in the know-how of communities, and I'm using the word know-how very intentionally, not expertise, know-how with its connotation of doing, relating. So, from this arises an obvious hypothesis. It's probably one you came into this room today already thinking about and knowing. Huh, I wonder. I wonder if we can weave these ideas together, these ways of thinking and doing, into a form that helps all of us accomplish not only difficult work we know about, but maybe even accomplish work we can't even understand now that nonetheless needs to be done. So, with that being said, as an intro, boom, let's play. So, this next moment is going to be busy and frenetic, I hope. If you prefer not to engage in that kind of activity, um, please just Stay calm and um, uh, be tolerant of the rest of us. And um, if you uh, have someone like that near you who does not wish to participate, please respect their wishes, absolutely. I am by nature an incredibly shy introvert, but I've learned to fake it because I believe that this stuff needs to happen. So here's what we're going to do. Um, my spirit animal says, only if you enjoy this kind of activity, rock, paper, scissors. The rules, rock, paper. All of these images, by the way, are in the Wikimedia Commons. They're all properly cited at the bottom, thanks to, yeah. It's, it's take a bow. Um, um, rock, paper, scissors. Rock beats paper. Paper beats scissors. No, no, so, did I do that wrong? I did that on purpose to see if you were paying attention. What did I say there? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so ignore the man on the stage. You know how the game goes. <laughs> that's so funny. That's what, work, that's what doing slides at 2 a.m. gets you. Um, okay, so here are the rules. Here's what we're going to do. Don't stand up yet. Everyone's going to stand up. You're going to face your neighbor. Look them in the eye, say hello. We go, one, two, three, shoot. Where I come from? So one, two, three, shoot. If you win, stay standing up. If you tie, do it again. If you lose, sit down, and then find someone else to compete with, okay? We're gonna have a Wikimania 2019 Stockholm rock, paper, scissors champion. I love the sound that's happening.
Do you need someone? All right. <laughs> it's a pitched battle in the upper deck. <laughs> it looks it looks kind of like you're casting spells at each other too. It's like expecto patronum. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> I really like the long distance spells. <laughs> do we have, do we have a, a, a section one winner? Oh, 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 brilliant. All right, are you still up? Oh, look at this. All right, please, oh, fight it out. Do it long distance. Do we have an upper tier winner? Is the upper tier washed out or are you still duking it out up there? I think the upper tier is done. How's, how are you guys up there? Do you have an upper deck winner in the cheap seats? You all are looking great up there. Winner over here? Do we have, here we go, wait, green shirt? White shirt? Yeah. Oh, should I call it out? I think this is, oh, three of you. All right, you two go first. Rock wins! Rock wins, right? Yeah. Rock wraps around, I mean, no, I'm sorry, paper wraps around rock. Jeez. It's jet lag, right? Okay, so there, here we go, and is the Wikimedia community is pointing to a big winner. Okay. Up there, standing, yes, here, okay, this is it. I'm gonna call, oh no, down here, you two. Ready? One, two, three, shoot. Oh, go ahead. Scissors, scissors? Scissors, rock, rock, rock. One more, okay, this is it, last one. Section one, cheap seats. You still going? Yeah. Oh, you're the best, you two, quickly, go. Paper. paper wins. And then up there, last, go, ready? Can you see each other? You need binoculars in this place. Okay. Yeah, no, 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 let's let, let move through. Call it out, scream it. That looks like scissors and scissors again. This is brutal. Paper, paper. Ah, oh, the Swedes, the Swedes are all about. No, you first, please. Rock, scissors, rock, rock. Hey! That was fantastic. Thank you for in, indulging me and enjoying that in the spirit of it. So this rock, paper, scissors is played in many, many places. Or this is another commons photograph. This is from uh, Myanmar. Some really cute little dudes playing away. It's also an ancient game. Uh, this is a eight, print from 1820. Village head, fox, and hunter. I think it had roughly the same rules. Um, you can play in Fortnite. Battle Royale. These two dudes, this video, um, these two dudes, are, they're armed to the teeth and one's wearing a pink bunny outfit. Is that a Fortnite thing? Um, and they, they show up in a clearing together to fight each other and they sort of they stash their gear and then they do rock, paper, scissors and one of them loses and is vanquished um, from the game. Uh, of course, you can play in Minecraft. P uh, paper, bedrock, and shears. Uh, there's a game show in the Philippines, Jackpot and Poi, that is super hardcore. They, they really amp it up with music, and there's a big prize. I think the winner wins $10,000 in each episode. Um, hey, and Wikimedians, this is from Accra, Ghana, the Wiki in Daba 2017. Anyone here from that gang? Is there a winner? Do we have a ringer from the, <laughs> this competition? Um, and uh, here, Adrian and Leon, two of your own. 
I was working on slides in the, in the lobby the other night and they were um, solving uh, turn taking or card drawing in the game they were playing with rock, paper, scissors and I asked if I could uh, hang out with them and film. I think that came out really well. I like the blur. <laughs> it's just very fast. Um, this is a good one too. Uh, this is Jimmy Fallon, an American television host, kind of a, a goof, goofy guy. Has, uh, they bring on stage Sophia, who is a, a robot, dressed up a physically human-like robot who uses um, algorithmic intelligence in her front end. And they have this encounter together on stage. And you can see Jimmy Fallon is he's very unnerved by this person, this entity in front of him, this, this robot. And they play rock, paper, scissors. And he's, he looks like he's about to scream and run out of the room at any second. There's something about play that's, that's leveling a way of interacting even between two, a species and a artificial entity. Um, and then there's this. <laughs> the robot says, I got you all day. <laughs> Bring it on, human. <laughs> so this is, thank you. Yeah, I think they deserve a hand. This video is, was specially, um, uh, gave special permission to us at this conference and the rebroadcast um, from the ish. Ishikawa Senu Laboratory at the University of Tokyo. What's happening is there's a high-speed camera that senses what you're going to do, processes it, throws the robot fingers in a millisecond. That's the loop, which is hundreds of times faster than our kind of slow homo sapiens sapien brains are, are, are doing that gummy thing that we do in space. Um, and so there's, there's, a, there's a point to this, um, this exercise, this laughter, this playing. I don't know about you, but I feel very different now, having laughed and walked around and seen some of you face to face and met some of you face to face than I did 15 minutes ago, 10 minutes ago. Um, the neuropsychology of laughter tells us that laughter stimulates both sides of the brain, um, activates the limbic system, connects the right and left hemispheres, Humor releases tension, which can, and this is a nice uh, phrase, it can lead to perceptual flexibility. Huh, flexibility. Um, many of the games used in improvisational comedy training, this article notes, can be used in product design or problem solving processes to promote associative thinking. Teams that do this kind of play before working on difficult challenges, dramatically outperform those that do not in study after study. Atul Gawande, the surgeon and writer in his book, uh, Cognitive, I'm sorry, not Cognitive Surplus, The Checklist Manifesto, tells of an experiment done in surgical operating rooms around the world. His challenge was how do we solve the difficult problem of how to dramatically decrease complications arising from surgery. The thing they found that worked the best, the most reliably, was to have each member of a surgical team introduce themselves, say their name, and what they were doing in today's operation. That's all they did. They went around in a circle and faced each other as colleagues and introduced themselves. Gawande says that there's an activation phenomenon among groups that open themselves up into their small public sphere together. Um, after three months of doing these introductions, surgical teams reported they functioned as a well-coordinated team uh, prior to the study 68% of the time, after the study 92% of the time. And it doesn't cost a thing. So, the infrastructure of play of dialogue, of conviviality, 
that supports solving difficult problems can be designed for. I've become a student of the body language of participation to look for ways in which teams working on difficult problems laugh and play together. Uh, these effects can be designed for. They can also be die on the vine if they are neglected. I read recently that when one shops at a farmer's market, one has 10 times more personal interactions with one's neighbors than if you shop at a chain store. That's a simple kind of civic design with a dramatic impact on some of the sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals that involve loneliness, the development of cities, neighborhoods, longevity, and health. Yes, spirit animal Patronus says, this can be designed for. Um, but only if design is allowed to happen early and often throughout the life of a project. And I use that word very intentionally, allowed, allowed to happen. It's not a commandment, it's, it's an openness and a welcoming to participate, to co-create early, often, and playfully when solving difficult problems. Like these guys. <laughs> yeah. These are the 2030 goals, the Sustainable Development Goals. And they are the underlying theme of Wikimania, much to the credit of your community and your local organizers. Um, these goals were designed with a lot of input from around the world, but they're hard to play with. Their infrastructure and position is about governance and messaging. They're hard to play with, though I know many of you in this room have worked on ways to open them up to play. So, we have, now that we're warmed up, you know that guy? Whoops, here we go. You know that guy? Um, uh, now that we're warmed up, we've faced each other a little bit. I'm going to, I have an, an, an assignment, a request, an, an openness for you. You have these little printouts in your seats, near your seats, of the Sustainable Development Goals. These were made with a, uh, a template of a hand stamp, sort of some of you may have seen me in the, the hotel lobby yesterday stamping these out. Uh, by the way, I'm exhausted. It's like, I feel like I did a thousand push-ups. Um, what I would like you to do is, um, we're going to take a few minutes, look at these goals, front and back. If you can't read one of them, they're not perfect. Ask a neighbor, compare. Most of them are different. I think there's 60 or 70 different prints that are circulating. And I want you to think about these, not, don't analyze them. Don't think about which is the, the best. Um, think about one that means something to you and your personal life, your lived experience, that you have a story about. I'm going to pause for a minute and let's, See where that leads. Think of a story, one of these that you relate to as a human being. Now, if you, and only if you enjoy this kind of interaction, <laughs> I want you to face your former adversaries <laughs> from the rock, paper, scissors tournament. Just two or three of you at a time, and just tell each other, say hi, if you don't know each other's names, 
say each other's names and just tell each other that, share that story, say it out loud. What is the story and what goal does it relate to? Go ahead. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. I'll say, I'll say. That conversation is like music. It sounds so good. I keep listening. I keep listening for that, that moment when you're done and I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> okay. We found, I would like to hear some of the stories. Um, and I would like to hear all of the stories, actually. Uh, and actually, there is a way, Liam, um, Liam created, I asked Liam, what, what, is, what would be a wiki media community way of sharing these stories? And he said, How, on a wiki. Um, so Liam, if you go to the, today's program page and you search for my name in, in this session and there's a link, share your story, um, that goes to this page. But I, I would also be happy to hear your story in person. Um, you can also write it to the platform of your choice and tag it, Wikimania. Uh, we'll find it. You can email me. I'm easy to find. But, but we found with Eric and, and Liam's help, we have a couple of microphones and, and I'd really like to hear uh, one or two or three of the stories, just really, really quickly. Um, and I think um, uh, I'm going to let you guys sort it out. It's hard to see up here. Um, Liam, do you want to? And if you, yeah, please. All right. Should I speak now? Yeah. Yes, please. All right. Hello. I'm Lucas. I'm a Wikipedian uh, from Germany. And uh, not at this conference, uh, but four years ago at Wikimania 2015, I asked myself what we as Wikimedia Movement are doing to reduce uh, our negative impact on the environment. And the answer was nothing. And that when I returned home from that conference four years ago, a Wikimedian friend and I, we started what is called the Wikimedia Sustainability Initiative. And this uh, initiative it uh, calls to reduce uh, the amount of carbon emissions that we uh, create by running the service, by, running, by, by hosting events like this, and um, we are calling for um, a sustainable investment of move and resources. And uh, 
in that way, I think this, this initiative touches on a lot of the, the uh, sustainable development goals. Um, so from hunger to clean water, clean energy, uh, to climate action, of course, uh, life below water on land, and of course mm -hmm. partnership, because we need to do that together. Mm -hmm. And um, now, at today, the Wikimedia Sustainability Initiative is supported by over 500 Wikimedian volunteers and staff members over the world. And um, I'm very happy that in 2017, the Wikimedia Foundation said, yes, this is important, we need to do something about this. And on Sunday, in the Environment Conference track, the Wikimedia Foundation will um, present its first ever sustainability report. And I'm very happy and very excited to see what then leads from it and what we're going to do about this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But If we had time, I'd ask you what it was that caused you to have that, that question you asked yourself. Another one, Eric, are you? Um, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Anna, and uh, I have in my hand uh, the SDG2, Zero Hunger which uh, relates to the eradication of uh, all forms of malnutrition, but also to ensure food security to all. This SDG is, is for me one of the SDGs, or well, not just for me, is one of the SD SDGs that is very transversal to all SDGs. And it's somehow the story of my life and, uh, and my work uh, so far uh, that relates to nutrition. This SDG talks very uh, strong to my mind, uh, to my heart, and to my belly. Uh, and the belly of the many million people I have seen uh, around in the world uh, working as humanitarian nutritionists uh, for the last uh, 15 years. There, and also back home in Guatemala, where I come from, and where the vast majority of people has experience uh, one of the different uh, uh, grades of, uh, of malnutrition. There is where I have evidence how aberrant malnutrition is and jeopardize uh, the fulfillment of any of the other SDGs. There uh, I observe uh, women who are normally those who are uh, mostly affected by malnutrition. When they have, uh, they raise children these children are very likely to be undernourished. Children that are undernourished are going to experience a lot of difficulty to learn in this school, if they are lucky to go to this school. Otherwise, they will have a lot of challenges to, to produce cognitively, with labor, with their force. So they are going to be in this aberrant cycle of economic uh, dependence also. On top of this, these undernourished children were adults, they are very likely to develop uh, some of the diseases associated to malnutrition, such as obesity, overweight, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes mellitus. And if we make a little bit of the logical cycle, these adults are again very likely to raise children with similar conditions. So as you see, uh, this SDG, malnutrition, hunger is so powerful and it touches everybody, every country, everywhere in this planet. So I really wish to have these scissors uh, that are there and just to cut and eradicate SDG, SDG to, well not the SDG, the hunger with a lot of, um, uh, very incisively. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> yeah, thank you. One more. Uh, hello, Florence. I, you said a sentence that really <laughs> rang the bell in my mind. That was, if design is allowed to happen early. Um, and I was thinking, one of the key feature, key, key design feature of Wikipedia from the start was uh, to allow anyone to participate. Yeah, that was the key design feature. And um, I often said, no one knows everything, but everyone knows something. But at the same time, I, for me, I joined. I'm French. I joined Wikipedia 18 years ago, and when I did, for over one year, I was the only woman <laughs> in the French-speaking space. Uh, and no one really seemed to care, and it was absolutely not discussed. There was nothing being done about that. And that changed, 
And the first signal for change was actually during Wikimania. That was um, Wikimania Taiwan, which was in 2007. And at that time, we had the first Wiki Women lunch. Guess how many people were there at that lunch? Give me a, a figure. No, it was not so bad, okay. actually. <laughs> but it was still quite bad. We were 12, right? So we were around the round table, and the 12 of us together, and I think there are three of us left. Probably should be in the room. There's Phoebe, maybe Phoebe's around, and there's Delphine. Maybe Delphine is around. Yeah, I see Delphine. Is there Phoebe? Phoebe had, yeah, Phoebe. So yeah, we were, I think no one else, am I forgetting someone? <laughs> no. So we were three, we were 12 at the time, and that was the, probably the, one of the first discussion we had where we tried to design a, a very mm. a strategy to get women in, uh, and then, well, 12 people, my friends, that was really not a lot. Look where we are now. So I fear I might not be at the next Wiki Women Lunch because they added a Wikimania comedy. But nevertheless, there is a Wiki Women Lunch today. So please get there and count yourself. So that in a few years we can say what's the difference. But in any cases, after that lunch, there were so many initiatives that erupted around the world. So I might uh, mention a few ones. I started Wiki Loves Women. I joined Les Sans Pages in the French space. There's often women in, of course, women in red with Rosie probably in the room as well. There are art and feminism. There's Wiki Donne. There's, yeah, from Camelia is around as well. So there's so many, many different projects that arise and that really push things. So that now can be super, super proud of our work and we need to continue. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So, okay. Oops. We've done these workshops, these conversations all over the world. It often, we're not often asked to tell stories or relate to big ideas through stories. Um, this was a workshop we did in Rio de Janeiro among um, some people in very difficult circumstances in their lives. Uh, we've done workshops with kids working through the, the big ideas of the sustainability, sustainable development goals and their own life stories through Lego play. I'll tell a little story about that later. Um, and if you think back on what, what we just did to, to, to transition into the next part of this, this talk, this presentation, um, the director of the Copenhagen Public Library said, we can do programs all day long where we put someone on a stage and people come and relate to them like spokes in a hub. Now we're trying to do programs that help people face each other <laughs> because these are the relationships and the citizens and the young people and old people who are the source of, of society, of, of, of humanity and of solving these making communities better. So we played, we got our hearts going, we faced each other, we talked, we thought about our own lives, and we had hopefully approached these or thought about these, or you would have to look at these goals a little differently, knowing that it was about you and not about the UN or the museum or the government. So um, I got an email one day. I was at the Smithsonian Institution having a tough day, <laughs> and I got an email. Dear Mr. Edson, uh, would you please join us at the, would you please, I know it's an inconvenience, join us at the United Nations in New York next week to help create the vision for a new museum for all of humanity. The goal of which will be to involve people everywhere to solve the sustainable development goals, to act on them. The, we think of this as a museum on three platforms a physical building, civic center, lab, hub, in first in Copenhagen, but then maybe in other places in the world if they need it. A uh, digital presence, and of course a network of people and partner institutions spanning the whole world. So if you're not too busy, we know it's an inconvenience, would you please come to New York to help us? And I, I took a walk around the block to calm myself down and checked the email five times to make sure it was addressed to me and I 
typed back, yes, I think I can fit that into my schedule. <laughs> um, um, so I went to New York, and then I went online to see what I could learn. Um, the UN was founded in 1945 to prevent another global war in the aftermath of World War II. 51 nations signed the original treaty, and at the time, the population of Earth was 2 billion people. State-of-the-art IT was the telegraph and shortwave radio, and delegates took steamships to attend the uh, first meeting of the General Assembly in San Francisco. Today, 193 member states represent the world's 7 billion people, and the UN's portfolio includes peacekeeping, economic and social development, the environment, human rights, and humanitarian work. The Sustainable Development Goals articulate 17 global challenges with 169 specific targets that we need to reach by 2030, which is 10 years away. There's not a second to waste. Zero poverty, zero hunger, gender equality, <laughs> climate action. The list goes on and on, and sometimes people see the list for the first time and they, they kind of, they're, they're amazed, they laugh a little bit. What is this? They're amazed, and I think that's good. I think that laughter is the sound of your brain waking up, becoming alarmed by something that needs your full attention. Um, the UN belongs to all of us, it needs all of us. It is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it's hard to imagine a world without it. And over the last seven decades, it has become, I would say, one of humankind's most important achievements. The UN is dedicated from the first words of its charter to we the peoples, but Currently, it's very difficult for we, the people, to act as stakeholders. There is no public place online or anywhere in the world where you can touch the UN, where you can learn about it with your mind and your senses, where it welcomes you as a, as a partner, and where it can become part of, you can become part of its work. This may be, as I was listening to John's wonderful opening remarks, this may be is how people thought about an encyclopedia 30 years ago. So again, how do we get difficult work done in society? How do we get millions and billions of people working together on global goals? The UN was founded by necessity to be an organization of governments relating to governments, nation to nation, uh, as you might say, gov to gov. But it's not news to you that we live increasingly in a person to person or peer to peer world. A world in which many of the problems and many of the solutions lie outside the domain of governments and traditional institutions. So a dramatic shift is needed in our thinking and our doing to reach these goals. The Museum for the United Nations UN Live is a startup NGO. We're a very small team. The idea was thought of in Copenhagen, so that's where we're based, but it could have been thought of anywhere. No one owns the idea. Um, we're close to, but not part of, the United Nations. We have a permit from the Secretary General to use the UN's name and brand in association with our work. Um, we're one of only two organizations that I know of in the world who has that privilege. Early on in the work of this project, people identified the need for a new kind of platform that could bring people from different sectors together to work on things that mattered. And early on from people who were not museum people, 
they thought that a museum could serve as that kind of convener, that kind of platform. We have a mission, and I'm going to geek out on missions for a second. We're starting something new, and these words in a mission really matter. So, uh, Clay Shirky describes institutions as frozen decisions. <laughs> you can't have a workforce showing up every morning or a movement showing up every morning trying to reinvent the organization from first principles. You need to lock in some ideas. If you're locking in ideas, you better be darn sure those ideas are powerful. So, here's what we've done. Our mission is to connect people everywhere to the work and values of the United Nations. Starts with a verb, connect. That's a very good action word. Who? People. What kind of people? People everywhere. It's the first project I've ever worked on that pretty much every, well, not pretty much, everyone on earth is entitled by right of being a human being to be a participant in and a beneficiary of. Not connecting to, what are we connecting to? Not the UN itself, but to its work and values. This is not a marketing arm of the UN. This is about its work first and its values. And, big and, the mission is not complete until the next part. And, catalyze global effort towards accomplishing its goals. It must be about the effort and the action. With the sustainability, sustainable development goals staring down at us, <laughs> with climate change staring down at us, this can't be just about appreciating the challenge, it must accomplish something. Therefore, effort, catalyzing effort towards accomplishing its goals, achieving its goals. We often now say our, we have a dream to dramatically increase the number of people in the world who directly participate in solving global challenges from the bottom up in their own daily lives. Some of the when you put a, a mission like that out into the world and you begin listening to how people react to it, you begin studying how people are doing difficult work that matters, some ideas and themes occur over and over again. One is this idea of bottom up, bottom up. If one were to place on a map all of the projects designed to catalyze effort towards the global goals, many of them fall in what I think of as a top left corner of a grid. They're designed from the middle, and participants are expected to follow the design of the designers. It's very different than Wikipedia. And that kind of effort is good, and we need more of it, but we think there is dramatically more potential in flipping the perspective around and beginning with people in their daily lives. Just hearing a few of the stories you've told about the sustainability, sustainable development goals, tells me that this is the right approach. Um, we wonder who, who is this institution for? We say, UN Live, the museum, is for those who are open to seeing things in a bigger perspective, are open to belonging to a bigger community, are open to using their ability to change something they care for, and are open to making a tangible change happen. We started out with a demographic. We're for teenagers who watch this movie in this location. It's much more constructive to talk about this psychographic this kind of mindset than to talk about what people buy or where they live or how old they are. Um, we also see very much a, a relationship between the very global and the very local. I think one of the big challenges for us in the next decade or so is how to wed local impact with global participation, how those two things fit together. This is also shamelessly an effort to get more people involved. Um, it's the saying from software, from early programming, with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Yeah, with enough people on the case, many problems that seem impossible are quite easily solvable. I'm also thinking about Joy's law. Bill Joy was the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, and he famously said, no matter what business you're in, most of the smart people work for someone else. 
Um, and actually, someone came up to me after a talk once and said, I used to work for Bill Joy, and that was really true at Sun Microsystems. Most of the smart people did work for someone else. <laughs> um, we talk about shining a light on people and communities. Our beginning assumption is that most of the behaviors, the problem solving, the ideas that we want to see more of in the world are already happening in the texture of daily life in communities around the world. We can't find that from the center, but they can find us and each other if we begin to shine a light on these extraordinary people. Um, and of course, a bridge to action. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, and through working with how do we create a museum that, that gets billions of people involved in accomplishing something, I've seen, this is, we call this our, one of our ninja moves. Oops, where am I back? There we go. Um, sorry, we call this a ninja move. This idea, many of the design patterns we think about and we see are things that people think about as being opposites on a spectrum. Um, we can solve these problems if people have more empathy. No, 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 we can solve them if people get busy and just start working. Um, emotion is the way to connect. No, no, it's intellect. Global, local, digital, physical, top-down, bottom-up, young, old. We're trained to think of these things as opposite and that we have to make a choice. What we're finding again and again is that these things want to be a circle. They want to be a system. Top-down and bottom-up work together. Digital and physical work together. Young and old work together. And our designs have to be sensitive to the way that these things fit together in daily life. Um, hmm. We're very interested in speed. Speed, speed, speed. And of course, I'm referencing the wiki wiki bus at the Hawaii airport that was, as, as legend has it, as Andrew Lee's wonderful book told me, um, the inspiration for the name Wikipedia. Wiki, wiki means fast, fast. There isn't a lot of time. We think, I think that humanity is facing a series of challenges that don't yield to our habitual understanding of how long things take and how much effort it takes to succeed. Um, Bill McKibben is here uh, in Rolling Stone uh, quoting an environmental activist, Stefan, um, does anyone know? Ah, skipping uh, out of my mind right now. Uh, winning slowly is the same as losing, writes Mr. McKibben. Um, if we don't win very quickly on climate change, then we will never win. That's the core truth about global warming. It's what makes it different from any other problem our political systems have faced. Stefan Zweig, the excruciating power of Zweig's memoir lies in the pain of looking back and seeing that there was a small window in which it was possible to act and then discovering how suddenly and irrevocably that window can be slammed shut. <laughs> and this from a lawyer and organizer, Agonizer Aditi Juneja, if you've wondered what you would have done during slavery, the Holocaust, or the civil rights movement, you're doing it now. As I said, we see ourselves as a, as a system with three main parts, online and network in the building. I think in a hundred years, if we succeed, and I think my experience here with you these last few days bears this out. If we succeed, the thing that will have made the difference is the network, it's the people. Everything else is a means to that end. So why are we a museum? Why would you make a museum to do this? Um, uh, museums are not universally loved. I'm super aware of that. Um, and I have a love-hate relationship with them myself. And frankly, the UN is not universally loved either. I was at a workshop in Addis Ababa. We were running and someone raised their hand and said, 
a museum and the United Nations, those are like two of the worst things in the world, and you're building them together, like, are you crazy? Um, but after talking with her, this person, and she, she, she said, and yet I came, and yet I came, because there's something within the vision of the United Nations and its values, and of museums, that seemed to her to be worthy of protecting or exploring. And also, she said that this little word at the end of our name, live, was intriguing. So she came. Um, and what we learned, there are lots of reasons to be a museum. Trust, convening power, the ability to mix and remix different kinds of experiences, the commitment to last in a, in a culture, in a community, over long periods of time, to be accountable for our decisions. Um, but the real breakthrough for, for me was in this workshop we did with uh, 10 to 14 year old kids in rural Denmark. Um, and, and what happened was we gave them a, a series of Lego bricks. And I wanted to ask them, like, here's our project. Should it be a museum? What should it look like? But often you don't get a good answer when you ask people directly. So we had them build little models. And uh, the first model they built was, I said, Build a model of a good day you have with your family. So, okay, click, 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 click. It was like music, the little Lego bricks coming in. And they showed their, their models of days to the park and going and getting ice cream and being at the beach with family or a vacation. And it was, okay, build another model, change this one a little bit, but this model is a place you go to learn about the future. It's part of your day with your family. And they go click, 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 click. Click, 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 click. They looked a little puzzled. Um, but they, they included a, you know, a building, a place with activities, a place that was sort of like a school, but they were kind of confused. I didn't want to use the word museum. Didn't want to use the word library. Just wanted them to sort of move into these ideas. Um, and, but they were lost. So finally I said, okay, it's a museum for the future. And they just looked so sad when I said museum. They just, they just died a little bit inside, like, okay, the game is up. We're imagining the future, but this is about somebody's museum. So I'm out of here. I mean, they just checked out. And we tried running this workshop a lot of different ways. If we didn't say what it was, they looked baffled. If we said it was a museum or about the United Nations, they kind of died a little bit inside. And after one of these workshops, I was very frustrated. I started asking them, what kind of places do you go in your community? Where, where, where do you go to have fun? What places do you love? And they said, oh, there's this place we all go to in the city center. What do you do there? We go there every day after school. We do homework. You know, what do you do? We do homework. We play games. We listen to music. We hang out. What's it called? They had no idea what it was called. It's just that place. Their teacher told me afterward, it's a library. They go to their public library. <laughs> every day after school. They had no idea it was a library, like couldn't care less that it was a library. Um, they went there every day. It taught me, it taught us that people don't think about museums and libraries in the abstract. Very few people do. They think about places that they go and love, places where they have good experiences. But these ideas of a museum or a library or a school or a conference are required as a little bit of a framing device to signal to people what kinds of experiences they have and what they might be asked to do. But from then on out, it's all about what the action is. All right. Hmm. Hmm. Head, hands, and heart. So, what we've, what we've learned here is, if we approach these challenges through only the intellect, if we use the information deficit of action and change, if you know more things, you will take action and solve these goals, we've learned that that doesn't work. Very rare, a social scientist will tell you that that kind of behavior change has almost never happened on Earth. It's very discouraging. Uh, and sometimes the opposite happens. Sometimes the more you know about a subject, the less likely you are to take action. On the other side of the frame is emotion. If people could feel a connection, a lived and emotional connection to the sustainable development goals, they would be more likely to act, to own these goals as their own and continue through to change and solve the goals. But we have very little evidence that that happens either. And on the third side of this, we have the knowledge of the hands. 
the habit of people doing and making in their daily lives that's seldom considered as part of the tool set for solving big goals. It's the kind of work I saw happening in the hotel lobby and in the hackathons and in your conference sessions the last few days. The habit of doing, of making, completing, doing is something that needs to be in the mix. So we say we're designing for head, hands, and heart together as one, one unit. Hmm. We imagine festivals, local gatherings, intimacy, physical presence is very important, um, but grown up from the local community level. This is a pop-up festival that was done in Leiden, uh, the Netherlands, uh, uh, about a month ago. Just neighbors gathering to talk about what they do and what they think. Uh, we think that video, global connected video, will be very important in connecting people to each other and the body language of participation and change. Um, <laughs> and play. You can tell how much we think play is important. Um, when I was flying over here, I was thinking about Pippi Longstocking. Do you know Pippi? Everybody knows Pippi. Pippi's a hero here in Scandinavia and in Sweden. Um, and I realized all of the great children's literature in the world happens when the grown-ups are out of the room, right? Like, where are Pippi's parents? Who knows? Um, where are the adults in the Harry Potter series? They're terrible adults. Most of them are very problematic. A lot of the great children's literature happens when the grown-ups are gone and people have to, young people have to figure things out on their own. But when the UN arrives, when these very complex goals arrive, when a museum arrives, people, it's like mom and dad are home. People shut down. And a lot of the creative process of opening up this museum to people everywhere is about getting the grown-ups out of the room <laughs> so that you, you can think and play and work. Um, we have designed a, a, a global, we're designed, we're creating a global participatory role-playing game to begin drawing people into climate issues, climate change issues through participatory imaginative play. All right, wrapping up. As you're in your sessions the next few days, you're going to hear about the SDGs. And this community knows a lot about how to work at a global scale quickly and reliably to achieve stunning results. It's a skill set that the rest of the world, that the UN, that this museum, that humanity needs, but we don't know exactly how yet. So my, my ask of you with what I've said and the waving of hands about emotion and intellect and participation, um, my ask of you is that you think of us as, we, as you move through the next few days and think about what you can add to this work on the global goals. Um, and I'll finish with a, a quote from Greta Thunberg. She says, adults keep saying, we owe it to the young people to give them hope but I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I fear every day. And then I want you to act. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for an inspiring presentation. We would like to give you this little diploma. And we made a donation to UNDP in, appre in appreciation oh, of this presentation. Thank you fantastic. so much. Thank you so much. Forgot this. <laughs> so. 
Thank you all. Um, now we have lunch, so you can please exit up there and you know, mingle around, network, and get new friends. Thank you so much.